this, because I think that what we know to be true, and, and I would guess, let me just take a quick poll. How many of you, I'm assuming everyone here is a parent, and so if I say parent or child, I mean loved one, you know, loved one if you're a different kind of family member. But how many of you have a loved one under the age of 16? Raise your hand. Okay, so mostly 16 and older, teens, adults. Um, Nearly two-thirds of parents do not have a life plan. So what that means is they really don't have something. If, if something happened to them right now, there is not a plan in place for what will happen to their loved one. That includes kind of financially and the vision of where will they go. So it's sort of disturbing information, but I think not shocking to any of us because that's why we're here talking about this. If we knew exactly where our loved one was going, you would be home watching football or whatever else you do on a Sunday rather than listening to us. But that's a staggering number, you know. Um, the, the next slide, I think, is, is related to that, is that when you, the, this is a little hard to see, but I can share information that, you know, a link that I'll share for, for you guys. Um, but it, it, similarly, if you look at employment numbers, and this is recent data, this is about all disabilities, not just autism. But the, I don't think it's probably shocking to you to know that 80% of people with a diagnosis of a disability are unemployed. And of the 20% that are employed, 80% of them work part-time and not full-time. So only 20% of 20% of people with disabilities work full-time. Small number. Okay. And the reason isn't necessarily because, bless you, because they can't work. It's because similar to what we're talking about and what Jessica does for a living is how do you figure out where people belong? It's the really the same kind of challenge as it, as it relates to employment. I talked about Liam and I talked about his struggles, uh, you know, the kind of the short you know, version of our story is Liam was diagnosed at, uh, before he was two with autism, pretty severe autism, um, very intensive early intervention, <coughs> kind of the poster kid, you know, doing well, doing well, doing well, had what we now know is not uncommon of like a secondary regression, uh, which was pre-puberty. Uh, so a lot of times with the chemi chemistry changes with our boys and girls, we see some intensive things happen. Liam had major intensive, intensive regression. Very severe. Um, residential care was just a given. And my husband and I had said, okay, well, we're not opposed to that. I have no judgment about Medicaid. You know, all everything's on the table when you're living a, a life of crisis. Everything's on the table. But our feeling was, Let's check through the list of all our other options first before we get to some of the more, what felt to us to be more uh, extreme options. So it took about three years. We were in sort of bunker mode, you know, <coughs> locked windows, locked doors. Liam would have to be restrained sometimes up to five hours a day. I couldn't be alone with him. I had been severely injured, da, da, da. I mean, we've all heard the stories. You know, Liam was that most severe case. You know, head through wall, arms through windows, you name it. So the future looked quite bleak for him, and um, we did everything we could, access, you know, the best people we could get our hands on. Um, we're really lucky to have really smart people working with us. You know, tried it, you know, tried everything. And slowly, things got better. Um, but we had been, you know, like a lot of us with PTSD, it's like, we, you know, we didn't hope for that much for him. Do you know what I mean? Just because we couldn't see it. And so I say all this because part of what I think our story is that I really like to talk to people about is that regardless of um, level or diagnosis, it's uh, proven, and you guys know this, you, we have all seen, you know, the, the stories is that with the right support and, and kind of raising the bar, our loved ones are capable of more. And I think it's safe to say that 100% of our loved ones, 100% have been underestimated in their lives, 100%. 
that every one of us right now, if we took the bar of what we think is possible for our loved one and went like this, we'd be heading in the right direction because we are all sub-optimizing what's possible, which is why so many times you hear of the, the stories of when a loved one leaves the home and goes to a different setting, suddenly they're, you know, doing things that the, you know, and it's not because it's bad parents at all, it's just that the setting is different, professionals can have objectivity that loved ones can't possibly have, and also they've seen it all, you know, objectively, so they can say, oh no. I remember when my son entered the school that he's in now, and the executive director, Leah was not their type of student. They had all the smarty kids, like Stanford kids that never went to the prom. And so, uh, Liam was not that kid. Liam was, you know, the, uh, you know, headphones, you know, and um, she said, Liam's not our typical student, but we, uh, I think there's a lot of push in him. And I wept. She said, I think there's more push in him than anyone has seen. And I was like, what does she see? You know, what does she see? And she said, so let's take, let's try it out. Let's see what happens. So getting to the financial literacy part is that math, you know, all this stuff was just not on the table for Leo. And um, for those of you who don't, who may know David Sponsor, um, David designed the program. David recently passed away. It's a huge tragedy um, for all of us. Um, but uh, David designed the program at the school and has really been the visionary for Liam. And he said, um, I, I want to set up a program where Liam's in charge of inventory at school. He's in charge of all paper goods, um, paper towels, stationery, you name it. So they set up this program. Liam got a budget from the school. And I'm like, they're smoking dope. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like smoking dope. So I'm like, OK. And um, so it did not happen overnight. It happened incrementally. Um, Liam's been now at the school for three years. Liam is um, has an Excel spreadsheet, monitors all of the inventory at the school of all the purchasing stuff. He is in charge of a financial budget. Um, he checks the inventory at school. He checks the pricing at the local stores. He makes the purchases. He compares. He goes online, sees what the pricing is. He goes to the farmers market every Tuesday. He walks around the school with an iPad tablet. He takes orders from all of the staff for the farmers market. They he puts it on the Excel spreadsheet. Um, Jessica wants a bouquet of flowers. She wants um, a bag of oranges. She wants apples and uh, beef tacos. <laughs> and she gave me forty dollars. And he makes all the purchases for the whole staff, <coughs> keeps track of it in an envelope, comes back, says, here's your change, here's your flowers. They didn't have oranges, so I didn't get them for you. But you did. So, OK, took him three years to get there. If you told me three years ago that Liam could do that, you are out of your mind. So what I learned is I know very little. And I have to rely on people who are much smarter than me to tell me what I'm capable of. Because people, even though I'm a proud mom and I brag about him and I think he's a great cool guy, I just, we all need to rely on a village to help us see what's possible. So on the next slide, you'll never be able to read this, but that's okay because we're going to have copies available for you. But what I love about this is that these are bubbles of different facets of all of our lives. So it covers skills that you need at home, financial literacy, citizenship, which means things like learning how to vote and being environmentally responsible, <coughs> health and wellness, hygiene, uh, community access, social recreational, <coughs> employment skills, self-determination, self-management. I remember when um, Liam was much younger and uh, it had been suggested to us to consider having him at his IEP meetings. And I was like, this is the guy. We just want to keep him from putting his hand through the wall so that we don't have to have the wall replaster. And But we, you know, we started aiming toward that. Now, Liam presents at his IEP. He came in with an iPad. He created a PowerPoint presentation. He sat at the IEP, presented to 
10 people in the room, including the regional center person, the, you know, the school district person presented to everyone, here's who I am. He polled people in the school and said, what do you like about me? What am I good at? You know, what do I need, what do I need to get better at? He talked about what he liked. He talked, so he, he really has been practicing over time to figure out how to share experience about himself so that he has that, that self-advocacy ability. On the next few slides, um, this, that one, you can't see the whole slide um, the way that it's set up, but um, what this talks about is person-centered planning. And Jessica really touched on that, which, and this will become very important as part of the self-determination process. We'll be hearing a lot more about it. There'll be a lot more people trained as facilitators to do this. Right now, there aren't as many people who do it well. Um, but what that means is that each individual with the diagnosis is really the person, no matter what their ability to communicate or otherwise, they know better than anyone what is right for them. We need to figure out how to support that process. So when you think about housing and living and quality of life, it starts with, and the IPP, you know, kind of will revolve around that for the regional centers. Who are you? You know, what what makes what makes your heart sing? You know, I mean, for my my son, it, it's a little challenging. I facilitated at the self determination conference how you figure out based on someone's interests and passions, how that leads to employment. You know, it's different for everybody. So for my son, whose, you know, favorite topics are Sesame Street and famous assassinations. It's a little hard. You don't see the direct link to the <laughs> You know what I mean? But, you know, they, and I'm joking, but not, right? Like, we all have a version of that, right? We all, it's like, oh, you know, hubcaps, you know, or whatever it is, you know. So, um, uh, bees, you know, that's a little easier, beekeeper, that's great. But, um, you know, we all have a version of that. But it does lead to, you know, someone had said to me, assassinations of Liam would be an incredible forensic psychologist, you know, like in the forensic world, you know, like figuring out, like, because he's a detective, he's, a, he's so fast on the computer, I, my eyes can't track as fast as he's doing research. And this is someone who's cognitively impaired, right? And he's like, mm -hmm. he's an incredible researcher. So there's, there's a lot in there. Uh, I'm uh, unsure what the best fits will be for him, but I'm not worried that they're, they won't exist because he has all of these incredible skills because we've exposed him. You know, he's worked at a restaurant for the last three years. And, um, you know, it started with really small amount of time in the restaurant. He has a thing with babies and crying and things like that. You know, it's like hard to go many places on the planet where there aren't babies. <coughs> Unless you go to like uh, the senior hour, like at IHOP or something. You know what I mean? Like I found like all the places that most babies don't go to. <laughs> but, um, but he's, you know, he's gotten better at it. He's gotten smarter. So I think it's like exposure, try things, figure out what doesn't work. You know, and like any of us, like I had five internships in very, very different fields before I figured out what I wanted to do for a living. I didn't know if you don't, you know, if you don't, if you don't try it, you don't know. So, um, the the next slide, maybe the one after that, try the next one. Yeah. So there's some resources here that will that you'll have access to that you can look and get more information about person-centered planning, much more um, detailed and and really good tools and stuff like that. So you'll be able to have access to that. So uh, I, with that, I'll just say, um, I don't know if you want to take questions at the end or how you want to do that, but um, I'm happy to entertain anything. And uh, you know, what I would say is, is um, you know, make mistakes, get really, really smart about what's out there. I know, you know, one of the challenges we have is we're some of the busiest people going because we're usually, you know, working parents, spouse, you know, IEP, you know, all the things that we're juggling. Um, but get as smart as you can about what the options are. Definitely come to Fred in 2016 because, and any other thing like this that you can, because the nice thing about it is that you're immersed in with 
really the smartest people on these topics. So you get smart fast. If you had to go out and research it yourself, it's just not as efficient. So anytime that you have you know, the opportunity to participate in something like this, particularly given the ages of our loved ones, make sure you take advantage of that. The other thing I would say for those of you who are in social media, um, like the Fred page, like Golden Heart Ranch, um, if you <coughs> Twitter, we're on, we're on Twitter too, but there's a lot of real-time updates and access. Also, we um, participate really closely with, um, there's something called the Coalition of Community Choice, which is seeking to change the way funding um, is accessed for all types of choices. Right now, the government says, you, based on the needs of your loved one, they can choose whatever they want as long as it's chocolate. You know, it's like going into Baskin Robbins. You can have any flavor you want as long as it's chocolate or vanilla. So what we're really trying to do is to broaden the access to funding for different types of settings based on the needs of the individuals. Similar to what was asked before about why aren't there you know, more. Um, you know, there are reasons for that. We're trying to change that. So um, the driving force behind that is Madison House Foundation. If you don't know them, go to their website, Madison House Foundation. Um, and it might be madisonhouseautism.org. Um, but if you type in Madison House Foundation, it'll take you to the website. They have a great array of tools and information and all kinds of stuff, person-centered planning, you name it that will really help to prepare you for, for adulthood. I'm just a parent that is actually going through what we're doing right now. I have, a, I have two kids, but my 19-year-old son, Drew, is um, in a facility now in Utah. And how we got there, really, the journey how we got there was my daughter. My, he, he, I have an older daughter. Uh, he has an older sister. I have an older daughter. And she went to college, and he always said, I want to have that kind of experience. I want something like that. We thought, okay, well, Drew, you're, you're a good student, but, you know, we're, you're not going to be able to go to, like, a four-year college. So my husband and I thought of things that he could do that could be accessible to him. And the four things that we came up with is a program that we wanted to go to had to be structured, had to have some sort of education to it, had to have vocational training with it, and had to have some kind of life skills with it as well. So that means uh, the, uh, the banking, the budgeting, everything that you hear, you've seen here today. Um, and we were, there was nothing in California. There was absolutely nothing that we could find that would fit him in California. So we did the best thing that we could do is hire Jessica. And, <laughs> and basically, we went around to look at places that would fit where Drew could go. And the only place that we could find was out of state, and he's actually in a really great facility in Utah called Waterfall Canyon. And I'm not here to sell that to you, but I am, because personally, it is quite expensive to go out of state. But we did have a um, regional center just recently come up to look at Drew at the Waterfall Canyon um, facility. And I gotta tell you, they were really impressed with it, and, and off the record, they did tell me that this, there was nothing like this that, that was in California and that they would really, really like to be able to fund this. Now, am I going to get funding? I don't know. I will all tell you if I do, I will, it'll be on my Facebook page, yes. <laughs> I will make sure everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah, but right now, um, the pros and cons with going away out of state, well, one is it is really expensive. I mean, you are you are probably looking between eight to ten grand a month to have someone in you know your child in this facility. But it's an all-in-purpose facility. They do everything, and you have you know I think the best money that you can buy is in a consultant because they know every place that's around here. And I'm not selling Jessica, although she's great. Um, the, the consultants that are around know exactly what's out there, what's a good program for your child, and knows if you if this is going to be affordable to you. So I I basically would say, you know, go online, look at these places, look at contact a, a an education consultant. Because really 
there's nothing in California right now that, that is worthy of where our kids can go. And Marianne's right, our, the level of where our kids are, the bar is up here. It really is. They do phenomenal stuff when they're away from us. It's unbelievable. But I, I do want to say that um, because of all this and the expense, I have thought creatively and out of the box on a lot of these issues and have put together a group of parents similar to probably what everybody else has done um, to look at how we can do transitional programming here in California. Um, so I, I have, and, and you're right, it probably takes about five years. I'm in the three, I'm in three of my five right now. But um, I've been working with uh, Dr. Di Diane Danis, I don't know if anybody, and we have a group that's together, and we've been mm -hmm. looking at programming, and we've done the programming, and we've done um, the admissions requirement as well. And we're just looking now for some kind of land or somebody to partner with that would be willing to do a pilot program with four kids and see how this goes. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is insurance. Insurance will not pay for any of this. Um, it might pay for some of the therapy, but it will not pay for any of the living. Uh, so that's the other problem. And, and to be perfectly honest, I think we have to come up with an action plan. And one of them, um, and I was just in San Diego driving here, and uh, my husband said, make sure you tell them that they should go to the government. And I think it's true. I think one of the big things that we need to do is do a legislative push on what can we do here in California because nothing is going to get done unless we really push for something here. And you can say it's, it's not going to happen, but I, you know, there are people that can work with us and will want to do some funding for us in California. There are. And just to say this as a plug, the CMS regs are all changing right now and the announcement's going to come out in terms of what the funding options will be. You have the opportunity right now to write and the window's going to close um, by the end of this month. So if you want, I can send the link out for however, you know, but a lot of us um, in social media have been really pushing people. Um, to write to their legislators, and if it really makes a difference. I mean, I know sometimes it doesn't feel like what you do can make a difference. It really makes a difference because if they know that it matters to you, then it really influences how, how the voting happens, and it's exactly what Mel is saying right now. It means that's probably one of the best things that we could do right now. Uh, the other thing is that there's a corporate model similar to what Casa de Ana or probably what Golden Heart is going to be doing um, that. Unfortunately, you know, there's wait list, and so there's not a lot of options there for us. And then the other thing is grassroots, that's us. I mean, starting something where we get, you know, four little bungalows, and we, and it's not just about the housing. I mean, housing is great, but if you don't have programming to go with your housing, it's worthless. So that's why having this group of doctors together and parents together that work on programming is really essential to, to, have, to have it happen. But if you can get four little bungalows together, you start small, you see how that goes, you've got to have the programming in place, you know, that's, that's one way to do it as well. So I didn't, I, there's so much more I can talk about, but I thought, you know, you might want to probably ask Marianne or, or Jessica more questions and stuff, so I don't want to take up too much of the time. I'm in the throes of it right now, so if there's any questions you want to ask about, what I did for housing or anything, we can do it later, or you can ask about it. Um, we, we had a similar kind of thing for, um, Liam had all these friends who were going off to college, who were typical friends, you know, like buddies that had, he had grown up with, they were going to college. And Liam said, when I graduate from school, I wanna to go to NYU. And um, we are like, okay, you wanna live in New York, but NYU is probably, so we went to New York and we looked at different places and, mm -hmm. What we heard him say is, I want to do something similar to my friends who are going to college. That's what he was really saying to us. So we spent a lot of time talking to him about that, and we were researching places that were, were similar in that way. Um, and one of the places that we found was um, a Camp Hill community in upstate New York and Hudson, which is a really cool kind of transitional program. It's not a lifelong program, but it's similar in that it's it's really preparing for all different kinds of skills. So there are a handful of those. Jessica's the expert, but you know, 
there are pros and cons to that too, as Nella said, is like transitional versus permanent. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes we think we know exactly what we want, like any of us, and then you get in that setting and you realize it's not for you. So there's a percentage of advocates that get into a living situation and realize it wasn't, it's not for them and they have to make another choice. So be open-minded about the fact that even though you want it to work, that to have, you know, enough flexibility that you understand that there may need to be a plan B as well. Um, I'm working with some developers right now who are for-profit developers, similar to people who are building um, elderly assisted uh, assisted living communities who are getting hip to the fact, you know, I'm like, whoever's the first to realize that this is a business that you want to be in is going to be really smart because um, it, it, the need so far exceeds, you know, the, the, I mean, the demand so far exceeds, you know, what, what we have available to us. So what we're able to do is to say, okay, as you're building, you know, think about these things. You know, think about sensory things. Think about sound. You know, think about all the things, not just, uh, you know, grab, grab an apartment building and let's retrofit it. You know, um, and, and they're interested in talking to groups of parents who are interested in apartment buildings or, you know, group settings that they'll build to specifications, you know, within reason. Um, and uh, so that's another option that we're hoping to blow out in Southern California because it's just, it's terrible here. Mm -hmm. 